accepted our invitation, we were absolutely delighted. As Sandeep just pointed out, and uh, Barjoy corrected him, he has worked for more than four and a half decades in the media. And what is most amazing about Barjoy is he has worked across the platform as a print journalist, as a television journalist, as a web journalist, as an author, as a documentary filmmaker. It is quite amazing the different media in which he has worked with and made his mark. Even more amazing is the fact that wherever you work, he created an impact as a truly investigative journalist. If you look at corporate journalism in India, whether it is in print or in television that you get to see, you'll find that most of the big stories have been broken by him at some point of time or the other. Now, I was researching his background on the net, and I found so much information that's very difficult to communicate all of that. But let me very briefly, I summed up some points so that <coughs> you get a sense as to those of you who want to get into media, here is the man who should be your model. He has never bowed before any authority. He has accepted challenges, he has broken new grounds, and his reports have been followed up by other media. As a print journalist, I mean, I, this is what I got it down from the net. As a print journalist, he has worked with, uh, he has worked with uh, Business India, Business World, The Telegraph, India Today, and The Pioneer. And as I mentioned, he is probably the finest corporate journalist in India and for a career spanning over four decades. He was also the face of television journalism. In fact, he was the, probably the first face of television journalism. In fact, when I was tra traveling from Chennai to Delhi once, I saw Paranjoy's picture on the Chennai airport. He was the anchor for the first business television journalism program in India. So uh, he worked with Television 18, which is now known as Network 18, for six years between 1995 and 2001, when he anchored a daily discussion program called India Talks. Then he was also with the Lok Sabha Television between 2017 and 2013. One of the most defining moments, seven and sorry, 2007 and 2013, thanks for correcting. So the most defining moment which I consider, or most defining contribution, he had had several, but to my mind, two contributions which really stand out. One is when, the UGC nominated him to Press Council of India, and he went on to become a part of a subcommittee that was set up to examine the malaise of paid news in India. And he came out with a 36,000-word, 71-page report. There were two members of the committee. And it really shook the conscience of Indian media, because we never thought that something like this was actually happening. So he documented it so well and presented it for the country as well as for people like us who are working in the media to understand that all is not well. And that's something all of you have to keep in mind as you proceed to become media professionals, that you have to stand up for principles. He was also in news when he took over as the editor of Economic and Political Weekly in 2016, which for all scholars is the final word when it comes to quality research-based articles. And he wrote an article of which on <coughs> Mr. Adani's empire, or starting or growing empire at that point of time, which led to a legal case or a notice being sent to the organization. So Paranjo, instead of buying down to any pressure, decided to quit. That made big news at that point of time. He's incidentally also an academician. An academician. 
he was just telling us that for the last 19 or 20 years, you've been going as a visiting faculty to the Indian Institute of Management at Ahmedabad. He's taught as a visiting faculty at IIM Shillong and IIM Calcutta. Also, he teaches, oh, okay, I mentioned IIM Ahmedabad, uh, where he teaches media and society, economics, politics, ethics, and technologies of mass communication. I mean, if I just keep detailing it, I think most of the time will get over. I'll stop over here. Let's welcome Parajoy with a loud applause. Thank you very much, Sunil. Thank you very much, Sandeep. I call him by his first name because we were colleagues for a short period of time in India Today magazine. <laughs> And the pioneer, correct, correct, correct. So I'm like an old fogey, a senior citizen. Uh, I'm, I guess I'm the age of most of your parents, or uh, perhaps a little older than some of them. And uh, I'm truly honored and I'm privileged to be here with you, speaking with you. And I'm also very pleasantly surprised that I only see about one fourth of you looking at your mobile phones. It's quite an achievement, considering that all of you are addicted to that gadget. I mean, you're desperately addicted. You're more addicted than the alcoholic, you know? If the alcoholic doesn't have his whiskey in the evening, his hands are shaking. If I say, don't look at your mobile for 24 hours, most of you will go crazy. I said, just stop it. Go for a long walk, go for a swim, listen to music, read a novel, read, do anything, but don't look at that damned gadget and you'll go crazy, <laughs> won't you? Desperately addicted to that gadget. So I'm pleasantly surprised that only a few of you are busy looking at your WhatsApp messages. Imagine what would you do if you missed that one? Your boyfriend may ditch you. Oh no, how can you not reply instantly? So you know, we, the subject that has been given to me is really about what does media ethics mean in today's day and age of the social media? And, and this is a subject that I believe is very, very important. And if any of you have not seen it yet, I would humbly request you to watch uh, a documentary film which is available on Netflix, and uh, that's called The Social Dilemma. I, I'm sure some of you have seen it, maybe it's shown as part of your class. It tells you how, I mean, the kind of addiction. You know, when I was growing up, we had these lifestyle diseases, cancer, diabetes, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Your generation is a new set of diseases. And it's not just anorexia. It's addiction to your device. I mean, I can see at least one person very, very neatly looking at a gadget. I've turned away from you, I won't embarrass you. It's all right. I, I, know, I know you feel very deprived if you don't look at that gadget. You know, because in the palm of your hand today is what used to be our newspaper, our magazine, our book, our radio station, our television channel, and much more. You can do business, you can book your ticket, you can do a host of things that you never ever imagined. I don't know how many of you know that in most parts of India there are more sims than human beings. Did you know that? Don't believe me? Check it out. We are supposed to be a country, uh, we are, have either, either overtaken the People's Republic of China or we are sort of about to overtake in terms of population about 140 crore, 1.4 billion Indians exist on planet Earth. Between India and China, we have about close to 40% of the population of planet Earth. The difference between China's 1.4 billion and India's 1.4 billion is that half of India's population is below the age of 27 or 28, and China is 37 or 38. We haven't had a census in 2021, but this, these are the rough figures. I'm giving you what are called estimates, or even guesstimates, if you like. Now you go and visit the website of the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India, TRAI. Try, try, and try again. Try harder, try. 
go and you'll see at one point of time there were about <coughs> 1.15 billion, about roughly 115 crore subscribers. Now what do subscribers mean? What is a SIM, S-I-M? That little gadget inside your mobile phone. Subscriber identity <coughs> module. Did you know it? Many of you did. Now, of course, there are several several people with more than one SIM. Uh, there are people with SIMs who don't use it. Uh, there are people who don't like to use SIMs, like that young lady there who prefers to talk to her friend. But that's all right. Uh, and uh, there are others who are too young. They're infants. So they still haven't begun using that gadget. So if you put it together, 1.4 billion and close to 1.2 billion sims. So it's no longer a phenomenon that is confined to urban areas, metropolises, or even small towns. Even in the most remote areas uh, of this country, you'll find mobile phones. People desperately addicted to that gadget. People desperately addicted to one of the biggest businesses on the internet, and that's pornography. A sleel tasveer day, that's what we call And our time it was a very furtive activity. Today is available literally at the click of a mouse. And unlike you, unlike you, unlike you guys who are privileged to use Ravish Kumar's memorable phrase, you are not being educated in WhatsApp University. Aapka shiksha, ye Bennett Vishwavidyalaya mein mil raha hai, WhatsApp Vishwavidyalaya mein mil raha India is the biggest market for WhatsApp. 500 million, roughly. Only country in the world. Because Meta, which includes Facebook, it includes WhatsApp, it includes uh, Insta, they don't operate in China. When you look at Alphabet, which is Google, which is YouTube, which is your operating system, Android, they don't operate in China. So we are the biggest market for all these guys. The biggest monopolies on the planet. Digital monopolies. And these digital monopolies not only are determining what you read and what you hear and what you see, the way you think, your behavior, your preferences, not just your favorite actress, do you prefer dips to piggy chops? No, you may not. Do you like noodles or would you prefer those ones? What's your favorite color, red or blue? No, much more than that. They're trying to actually predict your behavior. And if you, any of you are deeply interested in the subject, I'd strongly recommend a thick book by Professor Shoshana Zuboff. She's the, it's called The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. And, and it's, a, it's a thick book, daunting, intimidating, but please read it. It tells you how these digital monopolies are controlling our lives. And the subtitle is The Fight for a Human Future at the New Frontier of Power. I mean, you should read it. it, it I strongly recommend it if you want to understand how our lives and how our behaviors, how our minds are being influenced by that gadget that you're holding in the palm of your hand. And it's just two corporations I named. Meta, Alphabet, run by young people who are among the richest on the planet. I mean, they are right on top of among the richest men in India. Mr. Gautam Adani was a part of that, but now he's no longer there. But uh, they, they, are, they, are, they are running these giant monopolies, these conglomerates. Now, under this kind of a situation, and as your professor Sandeep was telling you, what is truth? What is half truth? What is partly true? What is hateful? They get blurred. But before I go to 
this uh, subject in slightly greater detail. Let me show you just for a few minutes that we were never like this. The change that has happened to our country, to India, has been not just a dramatic, it's been unprecedented. And uh, I've worn very various hats in my life, as your professor Sunil has told you. I was, for the first time, a litigant. I was a petitioner in uh, public interest litigation concerning the famous second generation telecom spectrum scam, commonly called the 2G scam. In the run-up to the 2014 elections, the BJP would say 2G, CW-G, or G-J-G. They say G-J-G is a good thing. 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 Now, it's 5G. It's a good thing. So, this is a 2G scam. And you have never seen your father, your father, your father, your father, dial that number. That's what a dial used to look like. You haven't seen what a dial is. No, you're always keen in numbers. So I'm not that dial the number. We used to remember numbers, you know. You'll be surprised. They were not 10 digits, they were six digits, sometimes less. And we actually remembered. We remembered numbers. We remembered our parents' birthdays. We didn't have to depend on Facebook, right? Those were a different day and age. So I'll just show you a little clip from this documentary film that I made a long, long time ago, or 12 years ago. And I'll show you the first three minutes of it. Uh, and you can have a look at what life before, or life just before the mobile telephone was supposed to be all about. I'll get back to you soon. politically independent, a telephone was a luxury. Six decades later, there has been a dramatic transformation. Telephones are with all sections of people in the remotest corners of the country. In 1994, the government of India gave up its monopoly over the telecommunications sector by allowing private operators to provide phone services as part of the process of economic liberalization. Pick it up, pick it up. The arrival of cellular telephony was to radically change the way Indians communicated with one another. The first decade of the new millennium saw exponential growth in the use of mobile phones. Today, for every 10 Indians, there are 7 phones. One in 4 people have a phone in rural India. In most parts of urban India, there are more phones than human beings. The telecom business was always lucrative and became even more so as India's market became the second largest in the world. But the playing field was far from level. Get idea. Though dozens of firms entered the market, only a small clutch of companies were privileged, and some benefited greatly from government policies. The other side of economic liberalization has been crony capitalism at its worst. Here's the story of the ugly underbelly of the great Indian telecom revolution.
Okay, thank you. If you want to view the full, full film, you can see it on YouTube. Uh, this was made more than 10 years ago. And those numbers have changed, as I just mentioned to you. Now, uh, the first point that I want to re-emphasize is very few of us could imagine that the internet would change our lives in the way it did. In ways that are good and ways that are not so good. And it's important for us to understand that aspect of it. Because ethics is not just about the law. It's about good and bad. Your perception and my perception of what is good and what is bad. What is virtue and what is vice. And the many, 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 many shades between black and white. It's never simple. What is the truth? Who? Who knows the truth? Is it that all our lives we're going to search to find out what is true? What is balance? What is Santulan? He said, she said. So and so said, so and so said. A says it's raining. B says it's not raining. You're a journalist, is that your job? To say A says it's raining and B says it's not raining. Damn it, why don't you go out and see whether it's raining or not? So even what is balance is again not a simple concept or objectivity. What is objective? Who is objective? The Hindi word for it is Vastu Nishtata. I mean, who decides what is objective or not? Suppose I say at the end of this speech, which I'm going to talk to you for about 40 minutes or 45 minutes, followed by a QA session, all of you write a 400 word report on what I said. Purely give facts, what I said or what, not, what I did not say. And many of your reports would be different. What's the headline? What's the opening sentence? What are the facts you use? What are the facts you don't use? So even when you are presenting what is supposed to be a factual report, your bias could enter. What do you consider important, somebody else may not consider important. And this is something that the media, as, me, as media professionals, we are constantly encountering. You give a good catchy headline, and people will read it. Sometimes people are disappointed after they've read the headline because the rest of the article that they've read doesn't live up to their expectations. But there are other occasions when you find that people are attracted just because of their headline. Or the reverse. You haven't given a good headline, so people don't read something which could be very, very important. In journalism, we call it the inverted pyramid. What is the most important part of it? What is the least important part of it? These are decisions that are taken at a subjective level. So who's objective or who is not objective? I mean, these are issues, these are debates, these are discussions that we have. How did Gautam Adani became, become the second and the third richest man in the world? If you listen to Mr. Gautam Adani, he gave a, a recent interview to Mr. Rajat Sharma, his company earlier, he had invested in it. He said the same word three times. Mahana, mahana, mahana. Hard work, hard work, hard work. Somebody else will say that Mr. Gautam Adani's rise is because he's a good friend of Modi, Modi, Modi. You know, it's, it's, it's perception, it's points of view. I'm not saying it, others are saying it. So, when you are trying to separate facts from opinion, that's where the problem arises. And the problem with a lot of, of what you read and what you read on WhatsApp and what is there on the social media is that it's filled with opinion. Professor Sunil Saxena has a black fact. I don't like Professor Sunil's black shirt opinion. What is funny? This is a very, very simple example. But that difference 
is what often makes the difference between what is ethically correct and what is ethically wrong. I'll give you one example. Uh, a young relative of mine, and this, this is not today, this is uh, maybe about eight or ten years ago, he calls me Mosaji. He suddenly came up to me and he said, Mosaji, Mosaji, aapko malum hai? Ki har musulman atangwadi nahi hai. Pagar har atangwadi musulman hai. So many kaam, hey, did you read this? He said, what's up? What is it? Truth? Half truth? Hate speech? Political bias? Whatever it is. The point is very simple. We are today being fed. We swallow. We regurgitate. We digest and then we excrete a lot of fake, false information. How many of you know the difference between misinformation and disinformation? You can be genuinely misinformed. Sandeep Bhushan was deliberately misinformed. Oh, no, no, he was misinformed. He thought I had 40 years of work experience, whereas I had 45 years. He didn't do it deliberately. But if he knows I have 40, 45 years of work experience and then says I have 40 years, then he's doing what is called disinformation. I work in three languages. So that's the difference. Disinformation, which is akin to propaganda, is what when you put out information that you know is false, which you know is fake, but you do it deliberately for some purpose. You could have a political purpose, you could have a commercial purpose. You could be paid by Coca-Cola to say, you know, I found a, a fly in this Pepsi-Cola bottle when I had it. Or, or you could be a rival of some uh, coffee chain and they say, hello, you know, I found a, a terrible insect in my coffee. And then you take a picture and you put it up on Facebook. And you go to town about it. You know, I myself have been the victim of what? So I'm, I, I hope you don't mind. I'm sort of, uh, uh, sort of, uh, what should I say? Peppering my talk with a little bit of personal anecdote. Can you go to the internet and, and go to a picture? Put Rahul. You know who he is? Papu ka naam aapne kabhi nahi suna? Put Rahul. Put, put alcohol. Uh, glass. Put glass. Put paranjoy. Ha. Ah, dekho, dekho. Ye liye dekhen hai. Chale jau. Wohi pe chalo. Go up, go up. All right, okay, a personal anecdote. You may not believe me, you may not believe me, but let me tell you something that happened. Uh, I promise to tell the truth and nothing but the whole truth. And I swear by the constitution of India, since I'm an atheist, I'm not swearing by God. Uh, okay, let's move on. Early January, and uh, um, I was quite cold. It was quite cold, you know. I had my muffler on and my my topi on and everything. And I was traveling from where I live in Gurgaon to meet somebody who's like a friend, who's also like my source. He's not well, no. You're not well. Are you all right? You had a late night. You want to go to sleep? Say yeah, one mind. No attendance required. Andre! Not that, you're just a little tired. Oh, you like her shoulder. Ah, I'll tell her, baby, you are so silly. 
you're harder than a red chili ever since you moved out of New Delhi. But that's all right. <laughs> traveling from Gurgaon to meet somebody I know in Patiala. You know Patiala is famous for uh, the peg of alcohol, yeah? But there are some very good people, very decent people in Patiala who don't even touch alcohol. So anyway, as I was going there, the, I saw there was a huge amount, a lot of people, there was traffic, and I said, what's going on? He said, Rahul, Bharat Joro Yatra. So all right, I said, Bharat Joro Yatra, chalte hai. And uh, two kilometers ahead. This is near Karnal. And says, "All right, I'll go." I said, "Can, can I meet him?" Ha, koshish kijiye tu nahi. So I said, "All right." So I stopped my vehicle uh, a little ahead. There was somebody driving me, and I said, "Let me try and meet him." And I went there. There are a lot of security guys around me. Apko jaane nahi denge. Ab kahan ho? So I then flashed out this card. I still have it. I don't know why I still have it. Bharat Sarkar Wala card. It's a PIB card where uh, uh, it doesn't have Mr. Amit Shah's signature, but it has a uh, kind of like a Minister of Home Affairs, a junior officer. I said that um, still not yet a uh, Deshadrohi, but yeah, some people might think I am, but that how does it matter? They're entitled to their disinformation. So they wouldn't let me in. Then they let me in. I said, I'm a rich Nagarik, I'm a lot of people who have talked about what they have said. Then they softened up and said, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Then somebody from his team recognized me and I went and I had a matlab. I was a matlabi. You see, I'd written a book, me, I'd co-authored and published a book on Drefen. It's called Flying Lies, it's just come out. It's about defense scandal. The subtitle is, the role of Prime Minister Narendra Modi in India's biggest defense scandal. It's almost, it's 550 pages, uh, available right now at Hardbound, 795 rupees. Uh, if you want a signed copy, you have to write to me. I charge five rupees for my signature. <laughs> Postal charges. Uh, just uh, shut this off. So I essentially went there, I, I took a picture of myself, I posed with the book. So I said, good publicity. Big uh, happened. So I, I took that and uh, he was okay. And then as I was leaving, I said, can I take a picture of yours? And uh, you know, he was having his uh, morning. He offered me, kya dege, paratha, ye. Well, I said, no, I've just had my food. So I, I said, okay, I'll have a cup of chai with you. And I had a cup of chai with him, which looked like that. You can just shut this off. I won't be using it now for a while. But the point is, at the end of it, as I was traveling and I put up this thing on Twitter, suddenly I started getting phone calls. The Congress guys were saying, what have you done? Have you gone mad? I said, nee, I took his permission. I took his permission and I said, can I take a photograph of yours? It's not that I was sort of suddenly sneaking up in front of him and taking a picture. No, I took his permission. He said, you don't know what they've done to it. Here go, here go. Then, before I knew it, there were 10 different calls coming from fact checkers. What, the, what have they done? What have they done? Have you seen what they've done? I was a victim. And I realized that fake news really travels. And by the time you deny it, by the time you contradict it, by the time you put out facts which are correct, the moment has gone. The damage has been done. So this is the other side of the social media. Your picture can be morphed. Everything can be done. I mean, in this case, the people who did it, obviously, they had a political motive. I had a business motive. I wanted sales of my book. So it's as simple as that. Haan, bad kar dijiye. Aapka dur bhaash yad sa. Aapko maanam tha hai, hindi mein kya kehte hai? Chalaya maan dur bhaash yantra. और आपका दुर्भाष्य यंत्र अत्यंत चलाक है, very smart mobile telephone instrument. You know today, and I'm not exaggerating, this has become part of our body. It's like the karai wear. It's like the vest, my underwear. That's what it's become. And here is the problem. If you look at today's contemporary India. You find 
every single incident of mob violence, mob lynching, <coughs> communities getting killed, there is a bloody WhatsApp message. It has become the single big, biggest instrument to spread hatred and disinformation. So why am, why, am, why am I saying all this? Because you, who have the privilege of being educated in an education like this, you must tell the rest of your contemporaries, tell others, the world that you're living in. It's the poison, the toxicity that has been spread in people's lives are truly unprecedented. Now, what's the problem in India? We have essentially a kind of regulatory anarchy. And that is really what compounds and exacerbates and intensifies the problem of ethics in the digital age. You have multiple regulatory authorities. And as is the case, uh, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. Let me just quickly outline them for you. You have something called CBFC, Central Board of Film Certification, affectionately called the Censor Board. You have three kinds of categories. You have U, UA, Parental Guidance, and you have A. You also have another category, which is called the Restricted Category, which a lot of people don't know. Say if you're a medical, you're studying medicine, you could actually be shown a documentary film where they show a woman giving birth to a child or a man's chest being cut off or a surgery being performed, but they won't show it for a general audience. So there are different categories of films. And the CBFC is supposed to certify it. But the problem is the CBFC has often been headed by people who are there not because of their understanding of cinema or the sociology or the economics of cinema. They're there because somebody likes their face. And they want to do all, all things good to the powers that be. So there was one particular gentleman, I'm sure you remember him, who said, James Bond, you're smooching for eight seconds on the screen? Cut it down to three immediately. James Bond cannot smooch for more than three seconds. I'm not joking with you. Check it out. His name is Nihalani. Pelaj Nihalani, I think. Pelaj Nihalani. Check it out. Maybe I've got the numbers wrong. Maybe it was 12 seconds and 8 seconds. But it was somewhere there. Now, you have one such body. Today there's a huge debate. What do we do with OTT platforms? I thought I'd seen violence on the screen when I saw gangs of Wasipur until I saw Mirzapur. Oh my God. <laughs> I couldn't take it. I wanted to puke. Yeah, I mean, you can take a little plastic bag, put it outside your shirt, and then, then uh, devise a little gadget, and you show in slow motion that, that knife sort of entering your stomach, and the stuff comes out, the tomato ketchup squirts out kind of thing. Can you imagine? How many kilograms of tomato ketchup went into the production of Mirzapur and Gangs of Wasapur? Now you understand it. Will an eight-year-old understand? Probably not. So when we look at censorship, when we look at all kinds of censorship, not BBC documentaries, it's an, it's an issue of how much, what do you show? I mean, depiction of sex, depiction of violence, full frontal nudity. This is a subject of a longer discussion. And if, I don't know, after this, if Benedict still calls me, I might come and give it to you. <laughs> then you have uh, somebody called the TRAI. Try, try again. They're supposed to be the technical and the commercial regulator. Then you have the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting, Suchna or Prasaran Mantrale. They are the license holder. They can withdraw your license. Then you have the Press Council of India used to be a part of that. It's a quasi-judicial body set up by an act of parliament, it has no powers to punish. It can't find, it can't legally put somebody behind bars for putting out fake, false information. 
it exercises its powers when it has to admonish somebody. Bad girl, don't do it again. Bad boy, stand in that corner. Go up and down, hold your ear. That's the worst you can do. Then you have various self-regulatory bodies. You have the BCCC, the Broadcast Consumer Complaints Council. Then you have like uh, other bodies called the NBA, not the National Basketball uh, Association. It's the News Broadcasters Association. And you have the NBSA, the News Broadcasting Standards Authority. And, and you have uh, ASCII, the Advertising Standards Council. Of India. You have all these bodies. You know, and sometimes they do their job, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they do a lousy job. You've seen these ads, you know, where a person, the color of a person's skin changes within seconds? Now, isn't that supposed to be racist? Advertising whitening cream, whitening creams. You are advertising, say, we are the best, we are the proudest, you know. <clears throat> so there's a lot of stuff which is completely unethical. But we have multiple authorities all trying to tell you what you should watch, what you should hear, what you should see. And, and what you should read. The point is they do such a lousy job of it, it's not funny. Today we are in the era of convergence where all the different media have converged. So what do you do under the circumstances? How do you control? Should you control? Should you control what you read, what you watch, and what you hear? Mr. Elon Musk used to believe in and people thought he was a free speech fundamentalist. And suddenly, when the government of India says, don't tweet the links to the BBC documentary, he goes by it. Yeah. The law of the land and the law of the planet. Is there one? So, you know, when it, when it, when it comes to free speech, for instance, uh, Article 191A of the Constitution of India, the right to free expression, it's a fundamental right. Har nagarika ek maulika dekhaar hai. Abhi vekti ka swatantra ta. The problem is not that. Article 19 has several rights. The problem is Article 19 too, which says there will be reasonable restrictions on the right to free speech. Now who decides what is reasonable and what is not? Is it your local goon? Is it the station house officer? Is it the magistrate? Is it the inspector general of police? Is it the chief justice of India? That's where the problem arises. So when this whole entire issue of what is free speech, what should be free speech, do I have the right to abuse you? Do I have the right to offend you? Do I have the right to do something which causes enmity? The public order is disturbed. Do I have the right to show something which is not just pornographic, which is Something that should not have been. I'll give you an example. There was a Muslim laborer in Rajasthan and a madman who's in jail at present. He and his nephew burnt him to death and shot the whole thing on a video. And it was widely circulated. And when the policeman went up and asked, Who's done it? WhatsApp says, End to end encryption. I don't know. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. What do I do? I remember what my son told me when he was 10 years old. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. How the elephant blows his nose. Does he do a tissue on a tissue? Or does he simply wipe it on his toes? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. That's what WhatsApp tells you. Somebody shown, shown another person being killed. A woman getting raped, and you said we can't do anything about it because it's end-to-end -end encryption. These are the new challenges of the digital media. And it's going beyond fake news, disinformation, political propaganda, commercial propaganda, and it is coming down to criminality. Plain, simple criminality. Where the media or the social media, or those who are misusing the social media, are actually accessories and participants and conspirators in criminal offenses, including 
murder and rape. I'm going to conclude very quickly, so I leave more time for questions and answers. You can ask me anything you want. Uh, I'll try and answer your questions. Most of you here probably will not opt for a career in journalism. Many of you might choose a career uh, as public relations officers, as advertising in advertising agencies. Some of you may go for journalism. But the question that you have to ask today is why is such a large section of the media in India, the mass media, why have they become so subservient to the government or those who are in positions of power? The central government in Delhi and state governments in states. And one of the reasons is that post-COVID, this trend has accelerated, is that the dependence on advertising by government sources have gone up. So you're told that, you know, where will you get your salary from? Angrezi mein kahabat hai. He who pays the piper calls the tune. Basuri Vajak is a brilliant Basuri Vajak. He can play you rags, Yaman Kalyan, but no. So you tell him, so he is being paid. So he has to pay. So if this is indeed what a fairly large section of the media in India has degenerated to, is it good for democracy? Do you benefit as a citizen if those who are in positions of power are not asked questions, not asked difficult questions? Now, I must tell you this, and uh, since I'm in it's Facebook Live and everything is being immortalized, and uh, yeah, your grandfather can also see it. Uh, India has had only one prime minister who has never addressed a press conference an unscripted press conference. After I stop speaking, any of you can ask me any question. Even a below the belt question. When did you stop beating your wife? Really like below the belt question. But there's only one Prime Minister of India who has never ever addressed a media conference where any journalist could ask him any question. He's always picked and chosen the people he wants to give interviews to. It's his prerogative. He has given interviews to one very famous uh, Abhinita, an actor from Kannada. Aapne naam suna na? Bhoot ek mahatapuna sawal uthaya ho maana maana niya pradhaar mantri se. Bola, Modi ji, aap aam kaise khaate hai? Aap kaat ke khaate hai ya chus ke khaate hai? If this is what the media has become, who holds truth to power? Who holds those who are in positions of power and authority accountable for their actions? Who is responsible for greater transparency in public life? Hamare jo, hamare jo samaj mein jo paradarshita aana chahiye, kaun zimita? So this is the point on which I want to conclude, except to tell you that though many of you may not be journalists, remember there are journalists and there are journalists. There are dogs and there are dogs. Dogs, better than human beings, no? Most of them. They don't betray you. They don't stab you behind their back. If they're angry, you know he's snarling. If he's happy, you know the dog's barking that way. And there are dogs and there are dogs. And they're journalists and they're journalists. Aapne suna ho? Watchdogs of society. Journalists are watchdogs of society. या रात को तीन बजे आपका घर में चोर घुस गया और कुत्ता भौंकना शुरू कर दिया। Great, the burglar has run away because the dog is barking. The thief doesn't know ये कुत्ता इसको सिर्फ भौंकना आता है, काटना नहीं है, दांत ही नहीं है। It's a bit like the press council of India, toothless, 
Two x is equal to three. So this dog is still doing, playing its role. It scared the burglar. It's a good burglar alarm. And there are lap dogs. Ravish, Ravish Kumar has coined this phrase. Like Godi Media is Ravish Kumar's phrase. Godi Media. He's the one who said, WhatsApp, Vishwa Vidyale. And you will Godi in Godi. You will sit in Godi. You Keep stroking the dog. Forget bark. Forget bite. It will not even bark. Especially if the Godi, if the lap belongs to a powerful individual, a powerful politician, a corporate captain, a general of the army, or maybe a, a mafia don. These days there are Apradis also in media organizations, but I'll tell you about them on some other occasion. But, so there are dogs, and there are dogs. And then you've heard about St. Bernard's, right? Big dogs, they rescue people when they are caught in a blizzard, in a snow blizzard. They actually rescue people. You've heard about dogs that help a visually challenged person cross a street. You've heard of dogs that sniff out drugs and explosive substances from a pile of luggage. So the question that I'm asking and the question that all of you need to ask yourself, because you are the future of this country. Tomorrow I'll be dead and gone. You will be alive and you are the new India. Is this good for democracy? Is this good for this country? And therefore, ask yourself, and you will arrive at your own answers. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you. If Professor Sunil had given me more money, I would have sung and I would have danced for you. Well, I'm sorry, I can't see them, but it's all right. Please forgive me. So, uh, do identify yourself and ask me the question and I'll just take some paper uh, and make a few notes. Thank you so much sir. So guys, now you can raise your hand, I'll come to you and hand over the mic. Uh, Ma'am, what I could do is I could take two or three questions at one time and then answer them and take two or three more after that. All right, please. Namaskar sir, my name is Santak Gupta. I am a Hindi BJMC. And my question is, sir, is that the first thing is not the responsibility of any person to see or understand or understand or understand or understand or understand or understand. Is that what is right and what is wrong? We always tell you about it. So, is that the responsibility of any person to see or understand or understand or understand? Sankar Ji, I want to say that your answer is a very important question. But look, one thing is okay. We can take some things in front of us. We can take some things in front of us. But everything is not in front of us. If you say that a person who is a real picture of a pornographic picture on TV, अब क्यों देखने चाहते हैं आपका हाथ में तो रिमोट है आप तो हटा दीजिए आपका उम्र आठ है आपको क्या सही है क्या खराब क्या खराब नहीं है क्या झूठ है क्या सच है क्या अश्लील है क्या देख सकते हैं आप ये हर समय एक व्यक्ति इस सारे विषय के ऊपर उनका अपना राय अपना मत एक चीज हो सकता है ले सकता है मगर थोड़ा समाज के लिए आपका पूरा परिवार के लिए और विश्व के लिए देखिए क्या अश्लील है क्या अश्लील नहीं है ये एक बहुत विवादित एक विषय है मैं आपको एक उदाहरण देता हूँ कुछ साल पहले फेसबुक ने एक कंपटीशन किया था फोटोग्राफ्स दैट चेंज द वर्ल्ड फोटोग्राफ्स दैट चेंज द वर्ल्ड एक अल्प उम्र का व्यक्त नाम के एक महिला एकदम शीज नेकेड नंगा है और पीछे नेपाल बॉम और आग चल रहे हैं। वो एक तस्वीर पूरा विश्व में लोग मत बदलने में बहुत ही महत्वपूर्ण भूमिका था क्योंकि लोग कहा कि जिस तरह से ये वियतनाम के ऊपर ये युद्ध हो रहे ये ठीक नहीं और ये जो बच्चा का तस्वीर 
दिस बिकेम असेंबल एक प्रतीक फिर फेसबुक ने यह तस्वीर हटा दिया क्योंकि बोला ये चाइल्ड पोनोग्राफी में हम बच्चों को नंगा हम नहीं दिखा सकते हैं दिस इज अगेंस्ट द नॉर्म्स ऑफ द फेसबुक अलग बात है कि फेसबुक पे बहुत कुछ चल जाता है झूठा खबर नफरत भरा खबर ये चल जाता है दिस इज हाउ दे बिहेव तो मेरा कहना ये है यस वी ह्यूमन बींग्स इफ वी आर मेच्योर इफ वी आर एडल्ट वी कैन टेक सर्टन डिसीशन but to say there should be no regulation for everybody in my opinion i main aapke sath sahmat nahi hu bas dhanyawad sir hello sir i'm hadasa i'm a second year bhmc student and the question sorry, i sorry your name please hadasa hadasa yes the question i had was we know that with traditional media about a powerful group of people or a person can suppress certain news so isn't social media actually helping people whose news is being suppressed to come out and express their truth and opinions because we've seen that many countries like uh, women have been coming out of the tragedies that have been happening to them and coming out of iran, social media iran yes. iran women of iran yes women of iran and also belarus the tragedies that are happening in belarus they are coming out on social media and explaining their truth and what is happening so is it social media helping bring out the truth sometimes you must a very good question and i agree with you social media ab aaj ye hazar sa cheez ek do dhara talwar hai it's a double edged sword it cuts both ways the internet has changed human society and i would be a fool to say human beings have not developed but since what the topic on which i spoke today was on ethics in the digital era i was more focused on the ethical issues you don't have to remember your friends birthdays anymore you know my parents my mama they used to have a diary where they should note down birthdays wedding anniversaries death anniversaries it used to be a little diary it's like a telephone diary where numbers were written by hand where you would dial those numbers yes those days are gone because today you depend on facebook there are several advantages when your professor sunil and professor sandeep and i we were your age to research you would go to libraries and would go through masses of paper just to find some a simple bit of information who was born on so and so day when did so and so day die we would go through pages and pages of newspaper clippings today you have google today you have wikipedia can you trust everything on the net answer no but you do have a lot of information that is trustworthy so as in the case of mainstream media there are portals you trust why do you trust them this issue of trustworthiness this issue jo hum hindi mein kehte hain credibility vishwasanyata kyu hai so i would agree with you but i do compare that with a sharp knife the scalpel aapne kabhi naam suna hoga s c a l p e l it's an extremely sharp knife it was made basically to help surgeons that surgeon would use that sharp knife to operate on a body and if a person's a part of a person's body was diseased then that part of that body could be removed and that person could become a healthier human being but that same sharp knife can be misused not just to pick your pocket but to maim you and murder you so whereas hadas i agree completely with what you say there are a lot of benefits that the social media has given today uh, more than 2 out of 3 persons on this planet are using the internet the internet has changed human society in ways which we could never have imagined undoubtedly but together with the positive side let's look at the other side as well that was the only point i want to say yes so so with political parties so my name is prabhat tripathi i am a bjmc second year student so with political party prabhat ji aapka pura naam sir prabhat tripathi prabhat tripathi ji 
Several political parties giving out uh, multiple uh, religious agendas to the new coming generation uh, and uh, barricading every word that we say because multiple people find different things offensive. How do you think India will be able to sustain its democracy? How would they able to? How would be they able to uh, actually justify that this is a democracy because everything is being barricaded? It's a very good question you've asked. Yes, and here, I will tell you what Sankalp asked you. You are also important here. Do you think everything can be barricaded? No, everything can't be barricaded. That's exactly the point that Hadassah said. You can barricade up to a point. Yeah, uh, the, the word for it, the phrase we use is confirmation bias or an echo chamber. This is what the social media does to you. This is what the algorithms of Facebook and Google and Instagram and YouTube do. You know, they think because you're interested in a particular party or a particular viewpoint or a particular ideology, that's all you're interested in. No. They don't give you the other side of it. We have to try hard. So this is the challenge that you get out of this echo chamber. That you try and get that same media to give you a wide and a diverse range of views and opinions that reflect the heterogeneity of this country. I ask you a question to all of you and most of you may not know the answer. If I ask what is India's national language, half of you will say Hindi. It's not. It's not. It is the Raj Bhasha. It is a state language. Okay, according to different uh, surveys, and we, as I told you, we haven't had a census in 2021. Maybe 40% or maybe more. But the point is, there are 21 languages in the 8th schedule of the Constitution of India. Your currency note has 17 languages. How many of you realize it? And there are four languages which use a common script. So English is not there on the eighth, in the 8th schedule of the Constitution of India. What do you do about uh, this woman from the Andaman and Nicobar Islands who was the last speaker of her language? The world over languages are disappearing. Why am I saying all this? There are attempts made by some people. Unity and diversity is taught to you. What should we be proud of? Who is an Indian? Is it that we all look the same? We dress the same? We eat the same food? It's like going to America and saying, Oh, I want Indian food. I said, What is Indian food? Yeah. What if I say there are 10 different types of food or 15 different types of food made in India? It's like you saying, I want Chinese food. What kind of Chinese food do you want? Punjabi Chinese, Bengali Chinese, Gujarati Chinese, or Cheswan style, or Cantonese style. You know, so the diversity of this country is something that I believe we need to preserve and protect. And that is where the social media, including political parties, Try and brainwash it to believe it. And if you say, go against them, Tukre, Tukre gang. You are part of the Tukre, Tukre gang. You want this country to be broken up? No. So here I'm saying that this is what the social media does. And I'm glad you've asked me this question because I couldn't touch on it. You know, in 45 minutes, you can say so much and no more. I think this is one of the terrible things that the social media does. It homogenizes. Once upon a time, the internet, I mean, English used to dominate the internet. Now there are many more languages on the internet. But it's still to reflect the heterogeneity of our planet. Whether it be Hindi, whether it be Mandarin, whether it be Spanish, French, Portuguese, Tamil, whatever, whatever, whatever. So I say it's up to you to not let the internet provide you information or barricade you. It's up to you. Look around you and you'll find there's a lot. There's a whole new world that can open out.
I tried to answer your question. Haji, any other questions? Yes, please. Good evening, sir. This is Dr. Sanjay Verma. Uh, I am associated with TST Song, Times School of Media. One uh, minute, sir. Uh, you have your name. My name is Dr. Sanjay Verma. Sanjay Verma. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. मेरा सवाल लैंग्वेज से जुड़ा है अभी आपने राजभाषा की बात की विविधता में एकता की बात की और दूसरा ये क्वेश्चन में कनेक्ट होता है फेक व्हाट्सएप न्यूज की या फेक न्यूज से मैं एक चीज़ देखता हूँ कि ये मेरा अपना इंग्लिश हो सकता है कि जितने भी रूमर्स हैं जितने भी फेक न्यूज़ हैं अपने देश के संदर्भ में खास तौर से वो हिंदी या रीजनल लैंग्वेज में ज़्यादा आते हैं और उसको रोकने का जितना डिस्कशन डिस्कोर्स चल रहा है वो अंग्रेजी में चल रहा है तो देर इज़ अ मिसिंग कनेक्ट नहीं पता आपके साथ में बिल्कुल सहमत हूँ तो अब प्रॉब्लम ये है कि सारा डिस्कशन जब अंग्रेजी में चल रहा है और सारी फेक न्यूज जब हिंदी में चल रही है तो उनको समझाएगा कौन जो फेक न्यूज फैला रहा है आप आप छात्र आप अध्यापक है आप आज ये निजी विश्वविद्यालय में अल्प उम्र का युवाओं को पढ़ा रहे हैं सिखा रहे हैं अत्यंत महत्वपूर्ण है आपका जो काम आपने बताया आपने बिल्कुल ठीक कहा जो खराब खबर जो झूठा खबर जो नफरत भरा खराब खबर ये अंग्रेजी में नहीं इतना आ रहे ज्यादा से ज्यादा हिंदी और अलग अलग भाषा में आते हैं और इसके खिलाफ आपका आवाज उठाना बहुत जरूरी हो गया और अगर मैं जैसे व्यक्ति अगर थोड़ा भी आपको मदद कर सकता हूँ मैं जरूर कहूँगा क्योंकि आप बहुत सारे ऐसे फैक्ट जैसे प्रतीक सिन्हा जो और ट्यूज मैंने बोला आप और भाषा भी कीजिए और आज मैं खुश हूँ कि वो हिंदी में भी और न्यूज़ का एक प्रोग्राम बंगला में भी है तो इट इज़ बिकम वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट आप जो कह रहे हैं अत्यंत महत्वपूर्ण है और आपके साथ मैं बिल्कुल सहमत हूँ कि यहाँ पे हमें सबको आगे बढ़ना पड़े पड़ेंगे और आप जैसे व्यक्ति आप अध्यापक है आप लोगों को रास्ता दिखाइए दिशा दिखाइए आपसे बस अब एक हम असल में हम लोग प्लानिंग कर रहे थे हम आपकी इजात भी चाहेंगे हम एक किताब निकालने की कोशिश कर रहे हैं मिस इन्फॉर्मेशन पर फेक न्यूज़ पर और हम चाहेंगे जो आज आपने गैस लेक्चर के तौर पर जितने बातें कही हैं हम उसको उस किताब में उसको ट्रांसक्रिप्ट करना चाहेंगे अगर आप सर ये सार्वजनिक हो गया ये यूट्यूब का ज़माना है मेरा अनुमति ले सबके सामने आप दे सकते मैं तो कुछ ऐसा नहीं कहा जो बाद में लोग कहेंगे कि मानहानि आपने किसी का किया कोई बात नहीं जो भारतवर्ष के बहुत अमीर व्यक्ति वो हमारे खिलाफ छह मानहानि का मुकदमा चल रहा है हमारे बारे में इस विषय वो अलग बात है मगर मेरा कहना है कि देखिए ये तो एकदम सार्वजनिक होगा बौद्धिक संपत्ति का अधिकार यूट्यूब का पास है बेनेट के पास है आपके पास है सबके पास है Intellectual property rights. That's it. What is in, in once you allow yourself to be recorded and broadcast, then you are you are in that sense giving up your intellectual property rights. Sir, my book was published one day, and my my side, who work in our book publication, so I have never heard that your book. चोरी हो गया अरे भाई चोरी नहीं नहीं पायरेटेड हो गया लोग मुफ्त में इसका पीडीएफ मिल रहा है दिस इज द न्यू मीडिया मैंने कोरोना के बाद हम एक किताब का दुकान आजकल बहुत किताब का दुकान बंद हो रहा है ज़्यादा से ज़्यादा सब लोग अमेजोन से खरीदते हैं मैं एक किताब का दुकान में जाया कि एक बहुत मोटा किताब था और एकदम उसका जो सुर्खिया है ना अत्यंत रो, रोचक How my family created the most dangerous man on earth? विश्व के सबसे खतरनाक व्यक्ति मेरा परिवार से है कौन है? ये Mary Trump, Donald Trump का कोई रिश्तेदार मतलब वारे वार इस विषय किताब के ऊपर हम पढ़ रहे हैं तो मैंने कि जाके मैंने पता नहीं 600 700 रुपया दिया खरीद लिया घर में ले आया मैं पुराने जमाने का व्यक्ति हूँ मेरे कागज I like the touch and feel of paper तो घर में बैठा था अगला दिन एक दिन दो या तीन व्यक्ति व्हाट्सएप पे पूरा किताब भेज दिया तो क्या भाई बेकूफ आदमी था मैं छोड़ दिया चक इन माई केस इट इज डिफरेंट मैं जब अंबानी बंधु के ऊपर जब किताब लिखा था गैस वॉर्स क्रोनी कैपिटलिज्म इन द अंबानी मेरे को एक स्टूडेंट बताया कि आपका किताब मुफ्त में मिल रहा है 
तो मैं हमारे साथ जो प्रकाशन में काम करते हैं मनीष है उनका नाम तो बोलो मनीष यार क्या करें हमने इतना मेहनत किया साल भर हमने काम किया इतना पैसा खर्च किया निवेश किया और ये चोरी कर लिया इसको तो मनीष आपके बोले चले चलो हाथ मिलाओ मेरे से बोला तुम पागल हो गए यू बिन पायलटेड कॉन्ग्रेचुलेशन क्योंकि ओनली वेन अ बुक इज पॉपुलर इज ए पायलटेड मतलब आपका किताब लोकप्रिय है सो इज ए वेरी गुड दैट्स द थिंग अबाउट पायलट्स देर पायलट योर बुक ओनली इज इज पॉपुलर Good afternoon, sir. My name is Nandika Mishra, and my question is for journalists who are working in uh, news organizations. Obviously, there is no immunity given to them when it comes to you know projecting their views in print or on social media. So, for us, journal, uh, you know, students who are you know willing to go into journalism, we obviously you know have some link to money also. I mean, we have to. I mean, we want to start with an uh, organization. so that uh, there is some sense of security so how do we you know try to balance our passion at the same time we have how do you balance ethics and money if your boss tells you i'll give you a promotion if you sleep with me will you go ahead if somebody tells you you know climb up to the seventh floor of this building i'll hold a net downstairs and jump and I protect you. Will you believe me? See, look, there are some decisions which only you can take. What your philosophy, what your ethical norms tell you, you should do or not do. All right? I'm giving you extreme examples to make a point. The question you asked is not easy. Today, journalism is not an easy profession. It is an extremely risky and a dangerous one. follow what's happening across the world in the committee of protection the committee for protection of journalists i could see journalists in a far worse position in mexico in azerbaijan i'm reading a book on pegasus i can give you a detailed lecture on pegasus the most dangerous spy way known to human kind my phone was compromised with pegasus i have reason to believe that does that mean everybody in mexico should stop on his journeys look what's happening in india and look what's happening to young people who do not come from privileged backgrounds like you and me what they're doing two young men in eastern uttar pradesh balia they expose the leakage of a examination paper and they are put behind bars another young journalist who shoots uh, uh, on videos of children being given sukha roti sukhi roti and namak young man who has asked a question to the education minister of uttar pradesh he is roughed up by the cops and put behind bars this is happening in your own country i'm not talking about defamation cases against me or against siddharth bhardwajan or or anybody and everybody so you take a choice there are several risky professions driving a riding a fighter aircraft is a risky profession becoming a heart surgeon is a very risky profession becoming a mafia don is a very risky profession becoming a clean cop is a even riskier profession you want to be a good journalist the choice is yours there are certain decisions only you can take but let me say with all honesty having been one for the last 45 years that i feel sad to tell you this that i became a journalist after indira gandhi imposed her emergency between 1975 and 77 i think the atmosphere for free balanced journalism is to be under attack and it has become more constricted since the 70s it doesn't mean that you should not be a journalist i keep referring to ravish though for the last month he has been ghosting me 
he is not responding to my messages. Sometimes you are in the battle not because you are going to win, but because you have to be in that battle. Because it's important for you to be a part of that battle. You don't know who's going to win and who's going to lose. Yes, Sangharsh pe kaun jitega ya kaun hanega, aapko malum nahi hai, hame bhi malum nahi hai. So I've tried to answer your question. Nandita Sharma. Nandika Mishra. Sorry, Nandita Mishra. Sorry. Nandika. Oh, oh, oh. I'm asking you, I'm not going to say that you have 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 to say that. Good evening, sir. Sir, here. I'm Shuru Bhargaj. I'm a second year Shuru. My question is that... Your name is Bhargaj. Shuru Bhargaj. Shuru Bhargaj. Tell me. Sir, my question is that the time of today, we all know that It's not actually news, it's views. It's worse than views, sir. <laughs> what I'm asking is that we as students and we as budding journalists we have to have to go in that field, so we have to have an idea of what is going on and what we have to do. So when we watch those channels, news to nahi milti obviously. So we have to watch one channel. Was Nagin ka shadi? Oh, Breed ka kahani? Kya baat hai sir? Khabar aur manoranjan mein kya fark hai sir? Main thoda mazaa kora lo. I understand. Mera beta show. Very, very important question. You have to fight, sir. You have to fight. You have to struggle. There will be enough people who will tell you, you have to cover me, my God. This is a lot of people. 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 कि पॉलिटिक्स अस बिकम क्रिमिनलाइज कि हमारे अपराधी राजनीति में चला गया है बिल्कुल ठीक है अभी समय आया हमें रिसर्च करने के लिए कितना अपराधी पत्रकार बन गया मैं नाम कर सकता हूँ आपको एक साथ जब एक मंच में अगर हम करेंगे ना शायद मेरे खिलाफ मानहानि का मैं एक व्यक्ति का नाम कर देता हूँ वो सुन रहे एक समय में ह अच्छा रिश्ता था, दोस्ती था। एक बार ने सैकड़ों बार उनका टेलीविजन चैनल में बुलाया में बुलाया। उस समय वो पत्रकारिता कर रहे थे। उनका शुभ नाम है नब गोस्वामी। मैं आज आपके न्यूज़ में चैनल में एक साल में जिन्हें मंच में कहना चाहता हूँ। वो अर्नब गोस्वामी आज अर्नब गोस्वामी भी हैं। वो अर्नब गोस्वामी एक राक्षस बन गया। He has become a monster, and I'm saying this on his record. If this अर्नब गोस्वामी wants to sue me for defamation, मैंने उनका माना नहीं किया। मैं क्या करूँ? जाने दीजिए। अदालत को बताएँ। Sir, वो ख़तम कीजिए आपका। बस एक प्रश्न मेरा ये है। इस तरह अगर हम आज तक देख रहे हैं, हम एनडीटी भी देख रहे हैं, हम एक तरफ की व्यूज ले रहे हैं, हम दूसरी तरफ की व्यूज ले रहे हैं, उसमें से न्यूज़ क्या है वो हम कैसे फाइंड आउट करेंगे? यही, ये आपके सामने सबसे बड़ा चुनौती है। सिर्फ ये मैंने कहा कि ना वो एक, दो, तीन में दस जगह जाओ, yeah, it's not easy, but you have to do your best. See, the, the way I see it, you won't, this is not an easy job. It's a damn difficult job, but you have to try. I, I, I think just the last few questions. The last question, the last question of the day, that's it. Only one more question. Uh, good afternoon, sir. My name is uh, Jaguar. I'm from BJMC second year, English. Uh, so, sir, uh, I wanted to ask, 
is the news on television which we are shown is it politically and uh, religiously motivated because uh, a few months ago uh, i was uh, watching a news channel with my dad i don't remember what but as journalists we were told that we should only uh, show show and speak facts which are be proven we should not give our political and religious opinion uh, on any matter but a uh, few months ago when uh, uh, during i think uh, holy holidays i was watching this uh, one uh, news program with my dad and the on field uh, uh, reporter was uh, doing a report on a uh, so called miraculous baba who could tell anybody so aap kis ko baat kar rahe ho no sir but ha uh, bolie but who could tell anybody's background just by listening to their name and the reporter instead of saying that he is this uh, baba or this man dekhi he fully supported on live television that he supported Or is it morally and ethically correct? All right, I got you. This is not good. Anyway, uh, how many of five or six people who wanted to ask me questions? Uh, maybe uh, quickly, quickly, quickly. Uh, there's just one or two. Uh, yeah, please, please, quick. One or two, yeah, please. Huh? I have to leave here for thirty, so I'll take your leave. Ask Professor Sunil Sachin to call me again now. I'll sing a dance for you. Can you call me? Saying is that 
It's not easy. What I'm suggesting to you is not easy. It's far easier to compromise. It's far easier. And at times, it appears very, very difficult. Ekdam lagta hai ki aapke saamne, aapka bhavishya ekdam andhakar hai. And the point I want to make, you know, the darkest hour is just before the dawn. So you have to, you have to wait for that. Sometimes that night is very long. Or वो ये रात का सुबह नहीं वो फिल्म है सुनील मिश्रा का एक फिल्म का नाम है. So that's all really I wanted to say. Young lady, Professor Sandeep wants to ask me a question. So this is just one question and I think it's also for some of my students in case they are there for the media law and ethics. Since so this entire business with Adani about which you've now started speaking, now it's a both civil and criminal defamation. Uh, so if you could just briefly tell us what exactly was the content, I mean something that you can say which is a matter of fact and not opinion or which is not controversial. And uh, what do you have to say about the laws of civil and criminal defamation? So just give us a brief idea, because I think you have cases in Mundra, and in several places in Gujarat, and I think one or two in Rajasthan. One in Rajasthan. One in Rajasthan. Uh, I will be talking about this in greater detail tomorrow at the Constitution Club. And all of you are welcome. Uh, it starts at 6.30 at the Constitution Club. I'll be uh, delivering the AK Gopalan Memorial Lecture on Angrezi Hindi Dhamma Bhasha Islam Khadiva. It deals with crony capitalism and how Indian democracy and politics has been weakened. A part of it will deal with the Adani Empire. <coughs> I lost my job at the Economic and Political Weekly for an article I wrote. This is a long story. Uh, I don't have the time to give you all the details, but uh, a situation was created where I could not con continue. No self-respecting person could have continued uh, in that post. So I put in my papers. This was in July 2018. I was 15 months at, at, the, at the post of editor. It pertained to an article pertaining to Adani. And if you wish to read it, you can read it on the wire. It is called Modi Government's 500 crore bonanza to Adani. Please read it. Uh, I was, uh, the case has been dropped against everybody, including the wire and my co-authors except me. A non bailable warrant of arrest was issued against me in January 2021. This is the problem. India is among the few countries in the world where defamation or manhani is both a civil and a criminal offence. What does a criminal offence mean? That on the orders of a magistrate, a police person can come to your home, put you in handcuffs and put you behind bars. In my case, I was accused of not appearing in court. My lawyer argued that that order of that magistrate in Mudra was bad in law. The High Court stayed the execution of the order. I made three appearances before that judge. And the case has been pending from February 2021. The two cases on which I have a gag order, please read it. It's available on News Click. It pertains to a former judge of the Supreme Court of India, Justice Arun Kumar Mishra. The article has the headline, Justice Mishra's Party Within Inverted Commas Gift of 8,000 Crore to Adani. It's a three-part article. That was third and the last part of the series. A lower court in magistrate has accused me, my co-author, Abir Das Gupta, and the portal Newsweek of lowering the esteem of the judiciary in the eyes of the people of this country. आदालत का मर्यादा कमजोर करने का कोशिश है। ये आरोप है मेरे खिलाफ। The gag order on me has been operational till since September 2020, about two and a half years. There are two cases: civil criminal, Mundra civil criminal, 
The fifth case is in District Barra in Rajasthan, uh, part of the same series. I appeared before the court together with a 75-year-old gentleman who is the publisher of Newsquick and editor of Newsquick, another 73-year-old person. We traveled about halfway between Delhi and Bombay to Kota. From there, we took a vehicle to travel 120 kilometers to go to the Grameen Nile. R.O.P. Hazir hai? Ji, R.O.P. Hazir hai. The sixth case has been in cool storage. I'll give you more details if you come for my speech tomorrow. Thank you very much once again.